Uh, welcome to the Elephant Cast on the Fourth uh, Estate. My name is Patrick Gazara, and I'm curator for the Elephant. Um, today we're going to be discussing uh, social media and the role it has played in the election and its nexus with uh, mainstream press. In fact, we'll be asking: Is social media replacing the mainstream media? Um, with me to to do this is an eminent panel. Um, uh, we have Motemiwa Kelma. Um, uh, who on Twitter is uh, at Wanjiko Revolt and he's an activist and uh, a human rights defender. Uh, we also have Mark Ma Ma Kaigua, um, uh, at Mike Kaigua in, uh, uh, on Twitter, who's the founder of uh, Nendo, which is um, digital, uh, deals with digital strategy. And finally, uh, Nanjala Nabola, um, a well known writer, uh, uh, political analyst. You know, um, and they will help us um, uh, discuss this and uh, uh, try and uh, tease out some insights into this. In the context of the election, um, has social media replaced the mainstream media? Does it augment the mainstream media? What role has it played? Maybe I start with you, Kevin. Um, I can't say it has replaced the, the mainstream media as yet because um, uh, most most Kenyans listen to radio, get their news off radio. The people, the voters, uh, the so-called masses, um, mm -hmm. get their news from um, uh, radio. What what um, uh, social media has done is become an, a, a, a agenda-setting platform, such that their voices, both in, in politics, in uh, civic space, uh, who use social media to influence what the media focuses on. Uh, political parties are using it quite effectively, um, and civil society is using it quite effectively, and what are called influencers are also using it very effectively to agenda set. Mm -hmm. uh, once you realize that the media is going in a certain direction uh, and it's not covering some stories, then it's, um, I think, Kenyans on Twitter, KOT has got it to a point where it can, can actually decide to run with a certain narrative mm -hmm. and then force the mainstream media to cover that narrative. Ah, okay. What do you think, Mark? Yeah, I think that uh, we, when we zoom out, we realize that there's been a very key set of changes that have happened in the broader internet and connectivity landscape from more affordable devices to better penetration of, of higher uh, fidelity and higher speed connectivity to, um, to the actual opportunities and almost the disposable time and attention to to put onto many of these um, these digital channels and that has seen traditional broadcast mainstream media have to grapple with this emergent and uh, almost nomadic class of an of an audience that seems to be growing uh, and seems to be growing tremendously in the amount of influence they have. Mm -hmm. I think it's I I think they are very complementary. I feel that I would never say that one can replace the other fully. Mm -hmm. um, it's a kind of the same way that at a certain point there would be no such thing as to use an analogy from my industry as digital marketing, but marketing in a digital world. You just won't have a uh, a choice. We don't say, hey, like we're a radio consultancy. It's more that you're a media consultant. You can probably take on right. any one of these platforms. So these are different uh, uh, platforms, different ways. I love in your experience, uh, uh, Nanjala, when, when you look at um, our mainstream, they've got a lot of flack for how they covered the election. It's not just this election, the past election. Is there a gap there that social media is feeling? Absolutely. I think the thing that strikes me is social media in Kenya gives space for people who traditional media does not give space. So like women, for example, um, the, for the longest time, the biggest influences on Kenyan social media were women, and in many ways, many still are. Um, but you look at traditional media, and aside from a couple of news anchors, um, in terms of actual like strong media figures, you can really count them on one hand, Dwaka Mimo, Rasnawara, um, Mdoni Wanyaki, and these are the same people who have been there for the last 20 odd years. Um, whereas social media has given especially young women a space to really um, articulate their concerns and not just, you know, the, the, there's this simplistic idea that when you're young, like, you know, when, when politicians talk about young men, they say, give them car washes and then they're fine. Right. Um, when they talk about young women, we don't even get that. You don't even get, I mean, what's the equivalent of the car wash for young women? Right. You don't even get that. And what Twitter has done is it's allowed this 
group to actually find each other mm -hmm. and to start to speak against this um, a narrative, this very masculinized, very um, a closed space that is traditional media and say, well, actually, you have to listen to me. And you, there's so many new voices, Nirima, Shefa, mm -hmm. um, you see them on television, um, you know, talking about things that are not c considered the traditional um, space for young women right. in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And that to me is what social media does. It gives people space who would not ordinarily be given space in the traditional platforms. Right. Uh, and I do point out, I think, an interesting uh, aspect. Um, we've got lots of people who are migrating from Twitter onto um, mainstream press, so they become commentators, um, analysts are invited on shows. But also the other way around, where you have journalists um, uh, becoming uh, a Twitter guy. Um, Mark, you were, uh, I read your piece that you wrote, I mean your paper actually, I should say, um, from cyber cafe to uh, smartphones, that kind of trace the evolution of uh, the social media space. I have two questions. Um, first, um, if you could just briefly articulate how that evolution went you know, um, uh, and how we've ended up where we are now. But secondly, I also wanted to tackle the preeminence of Twitter. Nyambola uh, Nanjala spoke about it. You know, um, Twitter, given that it's got what, about a million active uh, users, why is it that it is Twitter that sort of seems to influence what is on uh, mainstream press and set agendas, but not the rather much bigger Facebook and WhatsApp platforms? Yeah, so I think that if you look at the, the thesis or the main argument behind um, my, uh, my chapter um, in the book Digital Kenya published by Dr. Bitang and Demo and Tim Weiss, the, the main approach or uh, maybe just, just a quick bit of background was I, I, I thought there's a TEDx talk that I'd given where I was trying to show people social media is not new. So I went back and tried to find under each Kenyan presidency, uh, there was an example of social media that, that absent from technology would qualify in some way. So it made for an easy TEDx right. talk and very very like, you know, it was a great discussion. Uh, but when you're looking at, you know, doing like literature and footnotes and actually just like qualifying your right. argument, <laughs> I remember having sleepless nights where I was going through um, what uh, Christine Mungai would later, you know, another very like very well respected mm -hmm. new emerging um, young uh, female uh, voice that has transcended now, you know, through mainstream media. Uh, she, you know, her time going through these you know, these trials and these um, records of what mm -hmm. happened during the, you know, the, the, the torture that happened at, at the Nyayo Chambers. Right. So I was looking through that because you could not, I, I, I took, I picked some things piecemeal for the talk. Right. So the chapter basically led me, I had to, I had to place myself in modern times and the right. best uh, epoch for me or the chapter that I said I can speak from here on out with some measure of authority because who am I to go back and speak yeah. to? That those other particular right, times about you know, how social media came into being. Yeah, so That's so the, 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 the main the main thrust of it was that when the undersea cable made landfall, mm -hmm. things changed from that that month, that right. day. Uh -huh. And so it was in June of two thousand nine. But that, that that process beforehand had seen the cyber cafe rise and particularly the cyber cafe attendant as what uh, a lady called a uh, great strategist and, and uh, researcher called Nitty Ban describes as an infomediary. So right. the whole point here was that you have a, you've just gotten a phone. In many cases, you've just discovered email and an email address. And this is the person that helps you navigate that entire digital world. Right. And it's that QWERTY keyboard kind of intimidating. It's, it's learning um, the kind of functional literacy behind technology. If not in the workplace, then in a place like a cyber. And then lo and behold, as we said at the top, affordability, access, mm -hmm. and PESA, a number of other things in a kind of perfect storm. He, for Kenya specifically, and competition in the telco sector and in internet and connectivity, and you now have the the you know basically the factors that precipitated a very specific set of circumstances that allowed a transition within social media. Right. The best way to look at it also is during the two thousand seven two thousand eight general election. Mm -hmm. So at that point, what you actually had mainly were diaspora voices. Mm -hmm. right. There were uh, I think. 2009, I believe, the middle of the year, I'll remember the month and I can link to it. There were 300, according to a screenshot that I have, 
from uh, social bakers. There were 300,000 parents on Facebook. Right. There's 7.1 million today. So you had this time where even on somewhere like Mashada, which is this global messaging board and forum, you have what, um, what um, um, Eric Hersman and David Kobia, uh, David having started the site and Eric having been a blogger at the time, described as the first casualty of the 2007-2008 yep. post-election violence. Right. We could not add a single user onto that site uh -huh. because the level of vitriol and yeah. the volatility of the conversation mm. mirrored in in large part what ended what up happening on the uh, ground. Uh, in 2008. Yeah. 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 So really fast forward, it's just this leap that has seen well, us from, from, from there, from, yes. from, from, from Mashada. I mean, yeah. I, I used to also sort of participate <laughs> in those conversations sure. and the messaging boards yes. that were there. Um, and the aggregations that you spoke yes. of in your paper about um, Kenya blogs, web yeah, and right. all of that, um, to where we are now, you know, um, where it, it, it seems to me to be quite a bit much more atomized, if you will, you know, so it's no longer so much aggregations as sure. individuals, uh, peoples coming in. So how does that work? And I, again, yeah. I, I really want to get back to the point of Twitter. Right. Why is it that Twitter has? So uh, I can I, I speak. I, can speak. I think I think the main thing is that you have what I like to describe as a nomadic audience. So we don't have static audiences. People are you know have in, at times multiple devices, multiple personalities on different social networks, mm. multiple uh, you know some people on the blogosphere used to have pseudonyms. They were some of the early adopters of Twitter, mm -hmm. the bloggers, because they were naturally content creators already. Right. Twitter was described as a micro-blogging service. Mm -hmm. And some, you know, the cold taskers, the room thinkers, the there was a set of people who had basically commanded a loyal following on their blogs that began to make this transition that had even their audiences, right. like in the nomadic sense, follow them. And so what you initially had was this uh, very, very small, almost cliquish inner circle of mm -hmm. the Kenya bloggers were bringing what would later become Bake, and people who had saw part of the approachability of microblogging versus the intimidation of, hey, i got to put 600 <laughs> witty words together. Yeah. Um, and there were there was entire communities that were there before, if not in Mashada, then on the comment section of right. certain blogs. You see uh -huh. this today with Biko Zulu's blog. I've been in places where I've seen people refreshing at Tuesday at midday because that's when he publishes. And right. I've seen I've been behind and people, and are, people are refreshed because they're waiting for him to publish, right? And they're there. <laughs> and there are people who know one another in the comments. They have pseudonyms. There's a, an entire community that's coalesced in the comment section alone. Uh -huh. So you have I think Twitter, very clickish in the beginning, but uh, I think this aspiration that came from having no trends to being on the global trending list. And right. there's a, I, I give some of the earliest indications of this from, gosh, from um, everything from like Ruto playlist to like Gloria right. Nabeba <laughs> to all of these random phrases where Kenyans kind of had this closed loop. We just talk in this groundswell between many hyper-connected, with all due respect, semi-elitish digital citizens. Uh -huh. And yet the whole, we get the whole world to take notice. People in, Russia and Brazil and elsewhere, like what is right. <laughs> in certain name of hashtag from Kenyans? Mm -hmm. And that virtuous cycle of we can mobilize despite our small and minuscule size relative to the global right. population is part of what created this cycle that, that both created such a high desire for trending, right. which when you got local trends in 2013 in February mm -hmm. has started a whole new chapter, but ultimately started a sense of we have this identity, we can put our politics and differences aside because when KOT, whether it's Mark Mende, which also turned it globally mm -hmm. and became a viral African sensation, whether it was right. that, uh -huh. that, was a, you know, that was a muse for us to take and export cyber culture, Generation Y, all of these subtle cues in that music video to the right. global stage. Yeah, I mean, I get that. Um, Nigeria, want to say something? Yeah, I just mm -hmm. wanted to jump in um, to speak to your question as well. The difference between um, in my view, the difference between Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp, mm -hmm. Twitter is an open network. Right. So when I talk to you on Twitter, it, we're not just talking to each other. Mm -hmm. Other people are seeing that right. conversation uh -huh. and they can jump into that conversation. Mm -hmm. And when you build up, when you have these, uh, what uh, Mark called these uh, somewhat semi-elite um, users and this um, people who have a big following, people want to talk to those people. People right. want to be seen to be talking uh -huh. to those people. And it has this multiplier effect. So you end up having a conversation with 30, 40, 50, 100. I think 
the day that I got the most Twitter followers was the day that of the refu the security bill because right. I was live tweeting the parliamentary proceedings and I think I got about eight hundred new followers mm -hmm. in two hours right. because everybody, especially the diaspora people who can't see it on television, mm -hmm. wants to be part of this conversation. Right. Facebook and WhatsApp are closed networks, mm -hmm. um, and so I'm only talking to people who have accepted my unless I have a public page. Right. I'm only talking to people who I think are my friends, right. which cuts both ways. On one hand. It means that you have to be, I, people are generally, even though it doesn't always seem that way, people are generally more civil on Twitter than they are on Facebook. <laughs> because on Facebook, they think they're talking to their friends. Right. That's when all of, I mean, it's, a, it, it's not saying much, it's like a difference of like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but really on Facebook, you know, look at Moses Curry's Facebook page. Mm -hmm. He often thinks that he's talking to people that he knows, even right. though he has a public page, mm -hmm. and goes off on these random, mm -hmm. very vitriolic, very just nasty um, um, tangents right. because he thinks he's talking to a closed network. Uh -huh. And WhatsApp kind of takes that to its logical extreme. Mm -hmm. WhatsApp feels like a messaging service. Right. People think they're sending SMSs. And when you're sending an SMS, you can just be yourself. Right. You can just send, yeah, look. Right. I mean, I have to say, I always panic when I add a uh, Kenyan man, sorry, this is shade. Mm -hmm on WhatsApp and then you get those dots that a message is coming before I know them well I always have a mild moment of panic right I've had men send me porn on WhatsApp Whoa. I've had them send me solicitations on WhatsApp I'm like how did you go from I gave you my number in a business context <laughs> right, to you sending, <laughs> feeling comfortable enough to send me this because people think they're talking to people that they mm. know oh, right. and then but the way WhatsApp is set up you can have a group of 300 people and the multiply effect works differently. It, 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 if I put a, a message up and it's a group of 300 people, and each of those 300 people is in a group, in another group that has 300 people, mm -hmm. it, the virality travels differently. Mm, right. And it's dif more difficult to trace. It's more difficult to contain. Mm -hmm. It's more difficult. And, and because of the way what Mark was talking about, people having more people with smartphones and things right. like that, it goes into places where Facebook and Twitter will not go. Uh -huh. So I have been to Turkana, for example, like Boonies Turkana, and have had people take out their WhatsApp and tell me, is this happening in Nairobi? Like something oh, right. that they had about uh -huh. in the Benieri thing with the um, MCAs who went on their trip and then someone took a screenshot, I think. Right, yes. Uh -huh. In Turkana, people oh, wow. are asking about this. <laughs> like, I saw this on WhatsApp. Right. You'll never get that with Twitter. Um, you almost, almost never get that with Twitter, almost never get that with Facebook because of the way in which WhatsApp functions as it's replacing SMS. It's a cheaper way to SMS, mm -hmm. and so people don't think about it as a social media platform. Ah, right. Yeah, yeah but it's also a, a means, as you just articulated, of, of dispensing the news. You yeah. Know? Um, and I, I think, um, uh, tell me if I may ask you, they, they, they've articulated sort of the infrastructural um, uh, aspect to this, but I'm also interested in the use um, uh, um, uh, of it and then how it. Um, it, it, it it works. On Twitter especially, there is this sort of hard mentality where Twitter becomes like an echo chamber. You know? um, and I know Mark had described it as a KOT as a town square, KOT being Kenyans on Twitter, mm -hmm. you know, as a town square. You know? But there's this idea of a town square being a place where lots of people turn up and they sort of have discussions. Mm -hmm. But the way it, it, it occurs on Twitter, it's essentially groups of people having discussions <laughs> on this mm -hmm. town square, not essentially talking across groups. Mm -hmm. Has that been your experience and how do you explain that? Yeah, um, yeah um, I've, I've um, kind of experienced that in a way that you find uh, the people who react to your posts are the same, mm -hmm. or you generally want to look for content. I'll go and look for what has Nigella said, what mm -hmm. has Galara said, mm -hmm. what has so and so said. You, you find yourself being reigned in that, that space. Mm -hmm. um, and um, kind of because, uh, I would explain it because um, if you look at Twitter as um, an answer to a mainstream media that is not responsive to mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. um, a mainstream media that is owned by politicians who want to tell us something, mm -hmm. who, are, who, want us, who want to hurt us in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, as Mark has described, uh, the bloggers who, who, are, who are that close circle is another character of people who have come onto Twitter. People who have a voice. Mm -hmm. um, people who have um, who are able to see through the, the shenanigans and the lies and think that um, 
they can express what is really happening, mm -hmm. especially politically, to uh, Kenyans. And, and so what has happened is that a lot of us have coalesced together, and so we amplify each other. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I've been at a space where, about four years ago, deliberately started amplifying uh, people mm -hmm. who have a certain point of view. Um, basically, the point of view is that they speak the truth that nobody else mm -hmm. will speak. You are one of them. I think I amplified Thank you. you. <laughs> um, I took your blogs from your blog. Mm -hmm. Initially, without your consent, <laughs> <laughs> and, and tweeted them. And then we got to a point where we actually had a formal mm -hmm. engagement, and uh, we got your column in the star, mm -hmm. and the star actually gave your column. All right. So we took your content from your blog to Twitter, to the mainstream media, mm -hmm. which is also uh, what Nangela was uh, describing and Mark, mm -hmm. whereby I think uh, they, you alluded to it, where people like Schaefer, people like uh, Nelima, now uh, the, the female voices, mm -hmm. are coming out of that space of uh, Twitter, uh, going into the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, it's been very deliberate. So there are echo chambers that are deliberate. Right. There are some that are just coalesced mm -hmm. uh, naturally mm -hmm. um, uh, because um, birds of a feather fly together. Right. But is, 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 isn't there a danger when it comes to, Nigeria perhaps we might speak mm -hmm. to this, um, when it comes to political discussions and uh, uh, political space of having Twitter being sort of the engine of discussion but being so tribalistic, where people, in essence, I don't mean tribalistic in the sense yeah, of ethnic, but, mm -hmm. but essentially people mm -hmm. hide together in mm -hmm. groups and have certain conversations. Mm -hmm. And in these different conversations, there is a different set of facts being presented, different viewpoints mm -hmm. about the facts. So at, how can we pretend to curate a national conversation on Twitter when we can't even agree on mm -hmm. what the basic facts are? Mm -hmm. I think there's definitely a danger. And I think if you look at the US, they're a little bit further ahead on this journey than we are because um, there are way more Americans on social media than they are Kenyans. But, and you can see the risk there. Um, with the last election, the 2016 election in the US, um, what you had was people taking advantage of these silos. The silos will happen organically. Even in the, in the most liberal public sphere, people will talk to people that they want to talk to. Right. You don't just go around talking to anybody. Um, but the idea of the public sphere, the way it's, it's supposed to function is the media, the fourth estate, is supposed to do a lot of the heavy lifting with fact-checking, with um, verification, with making sure that whatever goes out into the public sphere is quality content. Mm -hmm. um, as Edwin said, as, uh, he's, uh, you know, the, the Kenyan media has not performed this function. It's not the last five years, it's not the last ten years, mm -hmm. it's the last 40, 50 years. Since 1963 we've had this media that has always given us a partial account of the truth. Right. And we've always sensed that. Um, with the US, the challenge that they had is that they had a period where they had strong media, and then came the Fox News era. Mm -hmm. And and that people start to coalesce around these media identities um, and expect that the media is doing that fact-checking job, mm -hmm. and the media isn't doing that fact-checking. It's, it's kind of um, compromised in terms of ideology. Right. And um, then comes the next layer, which is when people try to make money off of that. Um, you know, Facebook app developers, people who write the algorithms, Twitter, um, the Cambridge Analytica, you're all of these organizations that try and monetize this um, partial view that people have. Right. And for them, it's a business. They want to do it properly, and they want you to be Second Amendment, I'll guns all the way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's good for them because right. then they can sell that mm -hmm. as a political advantage right. to the Trump campaign. They can sell, you know, the 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 sort of even monetized feminism uh, to the Clinton campaign right. as here's a ready made set of voters that we've been cultivating for right. the last six seven months. That's that is how you end up in the situation whereby. 52 people get shot up and, and nobody wants to talk about the elephant in the room right. because it's, it's too political, it's too soon. But is that happening here? Yes. Yeah. And, and so the, the thing that, it's, it's kind of like a balancing act. Um, the only advantage that we have over the U.S. is that we have seen this in the past. Mm -hmm. We have mistrusted the nation and the standard and all of them. We have mistrusted KBC. We have mistrusted VOK. With media, mistrust is actually part of the, the, the package for us in Kenya. Right. And so, I, you know, when they, I think it was Odipo that did the study where they said how many people had 
seen fake news and how many people knew that they had looked at mm -hmm. fake news. 90% of people knew that they were looking right. at fake uh -huh. news. Um, I think that we are much more skeptical with content than I would say even the Americans are because we are so used to being skeptical about <laughs> content. <laughs> yeah, but is, is, isn't there, I mean, uh, the, the study you referred to, the Portman uh, uh, Geopol study, um, you're right, it shows 90% uh, of people say they've seen fake news. But the prevalence of fake news and the fact that it moves around, doesn't that mean that people are to some extent trusting it? So even though we come into this with sort of a skeptical uh, viewpoint, isn't it a fact that the fact that people push it and move it, they have some essence, uh, an idea that this is actually true? Um, yes, but again, it's it, the, the balancing factor is we've been here before. Mm -hmm. This is what makes me more, you know, um, for example, in the US, if uh, the White House releases a statement and says, you know, XYZ happened yesterday, everybody in any political spectrum will believe that because of that imprimatur that says it, it came from the White House and therefore it must be true. Mm -hmm. Um, right now, they're dealing with a president in office that they, that they don't know how to process what he does, mm, right. and, and it's throwing everybody for a loop. Contrast that with us here. If something comes from the state house, mm. <laughs> <laughs> already people are like, yeah, it's, it's I don't know about <laughs> this. Right. And it's again, it's not a function of the Kenyatta presidency. Mm -hmm. It goes all the way back. We right. are already hyper-skeptical people. That doesn't mean that everybody's equally skeptical. Mm -hmm. um, it just means that even when we open the newspaper, even when we watch television, we are already more conscious of um, the, the potential for manipulation. Not all of us universally, mm -hmm. but I would say we are more conscious of it than many other societies simply because of the way we've been interacting with our media for the last mm -hmm. 50, mm -hmm. 55 years. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I started reading um, The Nation when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, my dad used to buy, especially the Sunday Nation. And as I grew up, uh, and I started being more critical of the analysis, all these guys, um, you know, the Quendo Pangas and all these people. And then there was that scandal about Quendo mm -hmm. and uh, uh, having been compromised by Kano, who right. was the allegation. Mm -hmm. And I went off features. Right. And I found myself starting to read the newspaper from the back. Mm. <laughs> just, just with the spot page. Yeah. And then I get to the crossword, and then I would not go to the analysis. <laughs> you know? So, that, so that, that's, that's what Nigella is talking mm. about. Yeah. Because we've been lied to so many times. We've been programmed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in other words, we're being programmed to think in a certain so way. So is, is social media then a, a reaction, or the, the preeminence I just taken, is it a reaction to the failure of mainstream media? Um, not necessarily, but it does give uh, alternative voices a space, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's, it's not all echo chambers. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are voices that come out there, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and um, part of the initiative that I've been involved with called Maskani mm -hmm. has been mm -hmm. not amplifying people who I agree, who I, whose vo voice I agree with. Mm -hmm. I, uh, we've been amplifying people who have the courage mm -hmm. to say something, mm -hmm. to, to speak up, you know, and then you amplify them. Regardless of whether you agree or not, right? Yeah, you just give them a. If you have a, for example, when you go revolution, I rarely tweet my own content, mm -hmm. uh, my own thoughts, and all that. I do that on my own personal mm -hmm. Twitter handle. Mm -hmm. But when you go, um, the way I've structured the platform is that if Gadara says something that needs to be heard, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll retweet it. If uh, Mark says, if Nigella says something that needs yeah, to be heard, yeah, but that, I mean, the, uh, the obvious comeback to that is you will never retweet what you believe, guys. Uh, you, know, uh, um, you don't agree with that. Uh, you know, there's that thing where um, the, the newspaper and the radio and the TV are already amplified. Exactly. Right. Why, should I, why, should I help right. why should I help? Okay. I think, yeah. just, sorry to add, just to add to that, I think the challenge um, in Kenya is that we are losing, you do find that people go on to Kenyan social media, especially now, this August 8th to today period, on the defensive. Mm -hmm. And so um, what... I've noticed that's happened in the last five weeks is everybody's on edge and there's a lot of um, almost unnecessary um, anxiety. For someone like me who doesn't publicly identify with any political party, 
um, I feel like people are always waiting to catch me saying really? something NASA or something. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's like I actually get attacked by both. Yeah, by both sides. <laughs> I haven't actually mentioned the political yeah. affiliation. Um, and and what I've seen is that is that even if you're sharing, you're just sharing content uh -huh. because you think it's interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sharing the Supreme Court ruling because I think it's important for people to know. It's like, right. you NASA people, mm -hmm. right. uh, you know, or, you know, I'm skeptical about what Justice Moraga said at this point. You Jubilee people, you are Chief Justice alone. <laughs> right. um, and what you lose, when you lose the capacity for civil discourse, mm -hmm. it compromises the public sphere. Right. And uh, I think that's the challenge that uh -huh. we're heading in this particular period where and again, it's not just on social media, right. it's Sonko yeah. and Oino and all of those people. Mm -hmm. um, what you're seeing is it, it makes it impossible to perform the function of, right. of, of civil discourse of the public sphere. Right. And then that's when you really see the abdication of the media. Mm -hmm. Because that's where we're supposed to be able to say, let's take the heat off. You don't have to respond to a newspaper article on the same day. Mm -hmm. You can read it and then send a letter to the editor the next week. Right. But if the media isn't doing its job, then where are you supposed to do <laughs> yeah, this? Exactly. Actually, that's, that's yeah. the other thing uh, that I wanted to, to bring up, is the effect that um, uh, social media has on mainstream press. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's two ways we might consider this. You know, both social media is driving the agenda of the mainstream press, but also social media as a way of keeping the mainstream press honest. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Mark, how do you see social media working? Is it that it is driving, and to what extent is it driving content um, uh, of, of, of the mainstream press, and to what extent is it helping to hold that mainstream press to account? Sure, I, th I think uh, I'll, I'll even just build off of the mm -hmm. for, uh, couple of points that I've had before speaking to that. I think it comes down to two things. One is trust, and the other is incentive. So trust is in short supply in, uh, in, in the world today. This is right. just the, the one of the... The, the challenges we face, right? It almost feels like a currency that's in, you know, short supply. Mm -hmm. And if we look back, there's a there's a particular, like, um, we have almost like these, not trends, but like lenses for looking at Africans online and different, uh, almost like a mental model. And one of the ones we, we, we have that I think applies here is what we call um, passports to the internet. So the Western passport to the internet is email. Mm -hmm. And if you look back at, you know, the proliferation of email from the 90s with AOL and so on and so forth, there was a very email-based mindset that even, you know, the big four companies with all due respect, you know, of, you know the Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook, and um, I forget, you know, the, yeah, Apple, yeah, the big four horsemen mm -hmm. or whatever of technology, all within a couple, uh, like kind of like, you know, kilometers of one another in the US, their mindset, especially in the early and mid-2000s when Web 2.0, of which Facebook and Twitter fall under, mm -hmm. uh, were there. What that meant was that you could not join Facebook unless you had an email address from Harvard, then an email address from an Ivy League, then an email address from, from basically somewhere. Right. And there's actually people, we, we run, there's a particular uh, survey that we run. There are some people who, especially Gen Y, they, the only reason they ever signed up for an email address, only reason they stepped into a cyber cafe, I want Facebook. Oh, but do you have an email address? No. So sign me up for that to get this, because <laughs> right. this is what I actually want. Yeah. So, so what you have is you have that, that as an idea and identity. And the U.S. assumption or the Western assumption was that there's a sense of trust in the people we've emailed since the 90s. If you come to here, this part of the world, uh, Southeast Asia, Latin America, Africa, the lens is the mobile phone. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, other than that, it's actually the SIM card. So like, you know, we, we again ran the same set of questions and you find that some people had a SIM card before a phone, mm -hmm. a SIM card before an email address. Yeah, lots of people had, right. yes. And there's even, and this sounds like ludicrous to people from overseas and I've seen their, like, their bewilderment. Yeah. When, when, when you can actually be accosted by, by a robber, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you're being in the middle of an, 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 an assault. Mm -hmm. And there is a level of grace mm. that that person assaulting you has in the early 2000s, yeah, to, to leave you your SIM card. Because yeah. even I know <laughs> how hard it is to develop that. Right. And so there's a sense of trust in the SIM card and the social network that we right. believe allows WhatsApp to be 12 times the size of Twitter and Kenya right. and, and certainly hold a place that in the more like fun and lighter side allows, in our opinion, as of now, because WhatsApp, as Nanjala said, is dark social, meaning you can't measure. But I, I, I strongly believe that Gideri man would not have been 
you know, Martin Kamoda, the, 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 the everyman mm-hmm. voter who was transformed into a media mm-hmm. celebrity and meme would not have been were it not for WhatsApp. I think he was made in essence on WhatsApp that morning. Right. And he could have been, it was a, it was a lottery. It was five other pictures, mm-hmm. men with their kids going down and skipping the line, mm-hmm. him there and yeah, a few how others. Did that, then, how did that then translate to an, uh, uh, a mainstream media story. I, I, I'll get there. I promise I'll get there. Cause, so the whole point of even introducing this to begin with is that there's a sense of trust we still hold in that address book, in our phones, that is on WhatsApp, in the various social networks that, that, that have turned what is to the rest of the world an instant messenger into what we describe at Nendo as the default social network for Africa and other continents. Right. So that means that even social media as a construct or concept for us means different things to what it yeah. would in the West. Mm-hmm. And so when you look at that and you look at traditional mainstream media, you look at them consistently trying to seek out audiences who don't look at these two hallmarks of the morning paper to set my agenda and the nine o'clock news right. in the evening uh-huh. as, these, as these two things that in the age of VOK and the age of, of, of President Kibaki were the two hallmarks of, of a particular right. media cycle. Now it's my alarm clock and the notifications and WhatsApp and Twitter and, and so on and so forth. I'm in there. And the challenge from this has been how they acquire and sustain those audiences Mm -hmm. and most importantly advertisers as well. Mm -hmm. So the element of trust in their ability to report the news first and to reach out and actually like have a timely and meaningful engagement with people. The biggest challenge of this, if you're talking about fake news, is that um, if I look at the five biggest, uh, um, there's a fake news project we're wrapping up now from August 8th till, it was about a 10, 12 day period there. Mm -hmm. if we look at the elect- the primaries, those five stories and the respective fake news publishers and, and, and blogs that were there, they didn't just publish fake news. What right. they chose to publish, also I feel fake news in the context of the Portland study is, is a loaded term. Mm-hmm. Right. So yeah. I, but that's, that's like, that's right. semantics. Uh-huh. But I, I feel like in, in this particular case for fake news, some of those were vernacular in nature. Some of those were very personal to an existing point of view. I think what we forget is that people have actually made up their minds politically in some cases. Mm -hmm. That the actual, these undecideds, the people who could swing one way or the other are far more smaller than we give credit for. Uh And that actually, fake news, part of its purpose is to activate the base, right? right? Mm -hmm. And just continually further and deepen the Mm -hmm. connection there, right? Right. The the, the impending uh, victory, the the, the kind of narrative and, and so on and so forth. So I feel within that we get lost in some of the shades of gray of where we kind of look at it almost as economists where people are very rational, they make rational decisions if given the facts, yeah. they might not. Uh, 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 I'm sorry to interrupt, but the, the, the basic question I think still stands. Right. You know, um, uh, you describe WhatsApp as a default uh, uh, social media space for Africa. Yet, when we look at how our media operates, and even when um, you spoke about the call of action in your, in your paper, when they say, um, uh, tweet to us on right. this hashtag or via this uh, Twitter, it's always Twitter. You know? So I can so, explain why they over-index on that. It's, uh, it's, it's, because, it's because, I think it's with Temi, you said, who, if you look at, even, even though radio is still the very fragmented, but by and large, you know, that's the largest transmission medium around. In fact, one of the great ways I heard it articulated at a conference a few years ago was that radio is actually the, uh, the default app in Africa Mm -hmm. because it's on, it's almost, you know, on every phone, feature phone, otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. So you have the journalists themselves who were bought in one to social media, two to this kind of virtual arms race Mm -hmm. to compete with one another, right? So, um, I am, I am using my employer and their time and their literal physical infrastructure, you know, buying spectrum to broadcast, so on and so forth, to build my audience. Right. I can finally, if I'm terminated or fired tomorrow, and it did happen in the case of, you know, management changes at somewhere like EasyFM, they know an index for mm-hmm. Twitter. So you hand them 10 hampers. They will not give, with all due respect, right, people who sms in, people who wrote on the Facebook right. page, even though there's seven times as many as many there. Exactly. They will focus on people who tweet me. Look right. at the news on any major broadcast. That's the cause of visibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, and personal Twitter, interest. That, uh, I'll be flat out. It's personal right. interest. And I'm not going to call it narcissism. It's personal interest. And there's nothing wrong with it. Mm-hmm. So, so calling is yeah. expensive. Right. Uh, yeah. That's also, right. And, and, and yeah. I think... Uh, it's free. It, it, yeah, exactly. And, but, uh, but free, the, the challenge of, of, of... There's a reason why people on Twitter named Facebook after Kenyan slum. They call it Mukuru Kwa Zuka, but 
Zuckerberg, right? right. Because for them, <laughs> and, and, and yeah, you know, but it's the truth, right? And it's, this happened in the, it's a, it's the early or the, the earlier days, right? 2011, right. thereabouts. Uh-huh. And the reason was, oh, well, these jokes are talking about on Twitter. Oh, yeah, they'll get to Facebook eventually, won't they? Right. You know, like, <laughs> you see aunt so-and-so and, and, so, and this other person mm. discussing it there, right. right? And then, I mean, it, to further legitimize it, there are actual sections of the print uh, and magazines that take, literally lift tweets, lift updates, right. and, and place them and publish them. No, you know, sometimes some credit. But, but the, this, this process of, the, of this, you know, I'm not going to call it a vicious cycle, mm-hmm. but the challenge of that, I think, squarely lies in the fact that Twitter has a whole new lexicon you need to learn, right? You mm-hmm. get there, you start with zero followers. What does that mean? Right. I see you with this many thousand. I see you with this high level of engagement. And that's intimidating. So Twitter has an unbelievably high churn. Right. Because for all of the, basically, I'm going to straight up call it, hundreds of millions of shillings of free advertising that every major media broadcaster gives them, mm-hmm. they lock out much, literally, I, you know, we, we can run a business case of how much money they continue to lose by locking out SMS, for instance, mm-hmm. right, on the mainstream uh-huh. news. Uh-huh. And, and it's simply because at, at they've bought into a false race against one another mm-hmm. for a finite audience that even amongst that audience, right. it's four out of five people that are lurkers, at least if we take the election as the most mm-hmm. recent time. Uh-huh. They did not say a thing. They were logging on during that month. But they said nothing. No, they're just following other conversation. Right. Yeah, uh, if I if I may, um, you know, the biggest purveyors of fake news during this election cycle was the traditional media. Right. You remember on the day before the election, August seventh, the Standard had three headlines: mm. Raila senses victories for Nyanza Western, Uhuru senses victory for the Central Highlands, right. or whatever. And then in the undecided, they had it anybody's game. Right. Right. Um, the public.iabc.org.k um, you know, Mashara Gaido very proudly said, we have a agent at every single poll, uh, constituency right. tally yeah. center <laughs> in Kenya. So where were his results? Right. Why did they go with the public IABC results mm-hmm. and they knew that they had a different set of results? It, to me, goes back to that thing mm-hmm. where, um, and, and what social media does in this space, as you alluded to, uh, Galara, is it keeps traditional media honest. Mm-hmm. If KOT had not stayed on this mm-hmm. issue, mm-hmm. I don't think that, honestly, I don't think that the judgment would have come down the way it did. Mm-hmm. I think it was a group of very determined people mm-hmm. who stayed on the fact, mm-hmm. I mean, not to lump myself in that category, but I was following the rejected votes mm-hmm. the entire right. time. And they went all the way up to 400,000 votes, and everybody said it. A lot of people tweeted at me and said, I, had, I got into a back and forth with a very eminent professor right. who said, it doesn't matter. <sighs> to my shock and, and horror, <laughs> as I'm watching the Supreme Court proceedings, rejected votes 81,070. Right, yeah. <laughs> what happened to, literally, that's like, the scale of diminution is, is amazing. Right. So what happened? Why did the media report on these results if A, they had their own Mm -hmm. observers and B, they must have known if the IBC itself was saying that was statistics. What did you want to say? It's just statistics. It's just data, yeah. So the biggest purveyors of fake news during Mm -hmm. this period were the traditional media. So when when people are looking at, it speaks to what Mark was saying, I think, that we can't just import um, Western frameworks Mm -hmm. of thinking about things, we just can't just graft them Mm -hmm. on. There's a very specific circumstance that's happening in Kenya. There's a very specific reason why we are able to take on text-based technology faster than almost any other. I think South Africa and Nigeria are the two African economies that supersede us. Because we have one of the highest literacy rates in Africa. I used to live in Madagascar. Literacy rate in Madagascar is, I think, 32% or something like that. So nobody, they've tried M-Pesa, they've tried Mm -hmm. text-based technology. It does not take off. Then there's the French-English thing. Twitter is optimized for English. Facebook is optimized for French. Mm -hmm. So Francophone Africa tends to gravitate towards Facebook. You know, there's a whole set of circumstances that are very unique and we can't just say because fake news is XYZ in the US that fake news is also XYZ. Yeah, and, and, and as since you raised the issue of language um, and, and, and uh, uh, there's a piece that you wrote um, uh, uh, about how language is used in politics. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I thought was quite perceptive in the way it says I mean, they, they speak policy in English but when they want to sort of speak their hearts, you know, it all goes in, in, in Swahili and in vernacular. 
you know, and, and we all remember when Moy would give his speech in English and then put that aside and then actually speaks. Um, Twitter is, as you said, optimized for English. How does that affect the conversations that you have on Twitter? Are they more policy? Are we doing Kusanganyana in English yeah. on Twitter? I, I think it has a huge impact. Mm. And um, I think one of the running jerks in, I, I would say even if there's such a thing as African Twitter, is how South Africans use Twitter. Because mm -hmm. South Africans will start in English and then switch to their local languages halfway through. Right. And it frustrates the heck out of the rest of us because right. we're trying to talk to you yeah. guys and we don't know what you're saying. Right. Um, Kenyans don't do that. Uh -huh. I mean, I personally have been experimenting with it very deliberately in the last few weeks, mm -hmm. um, switching between the two, but it doesn't. it's not organic, it's right. not natural. Uh -huh. um, I think that it affects who is able to participate in the conversation. Right. So if you look at the numbers, it starts from the big sample, 48 million Kenyans. How many have access to the internet? How many have access to, uh, even on their phone or whatever, how many have access to leisure time that allows them mm -hmm. to be on the internet for sustained periods of time? How many of them are able to converse in either English or Swahili regular. It just becomes small, 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 and then you're left with a handful of, I think, five million um, Twitter users? I think. Like, well, a million. Five, let's say a million users, yeah, right? right. Uh, Twitter users. 78% of those users are in Nairobi, mm. you know, right, and yes. then everybody else. <laughs> of the 78% who are in Nairobi, how many are um, of a set, because it's also age, you know, um, yes, we're getting younger and more young people have mobile phones, but you've also locked out an entire generation that's right, gone uh, ahead. Um, and so it means that there's a very specific subset of Kenya that's talking to each other in a very specific language. Right. And there is that element of Kusenganyana. Mm -hmm. There is that element of, if I say Itumbots, everybody of a certain age in Nairobi knows who I'm talking right. about. If I go home and say to my mom, the two bots. She has no idea what it is. <laughs> who, first of all, who is it to me? And yeah. then, <laughs> you know? Right. And, and so there's that whole, um, we've locked, a, it locks a certain group of people out. You don't even need to go to your mom. Just say it on Facebook. Just, even, yeah. yeah, even, but anyway, even yeah. if you say it on Facebook, uh -huh. many, many Kenyan Facebook users will have no idea what a Chumbot is. Right. Um, what Mark was alluding to is, uh, is really, it holds really true that, Especially, I think it's a natural thing for us because you have Sheng, right. this amalgamation of different things. We've developed not just a Twitter vernacular, but a KOT vernacular. Mm -hmm. There's many shorthands that we use with each other that make it possible for us to um, shorthand, say things right. in 140 characters right. and have that punch. When I say Arab Singh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody knows who I'm talking about. Right. I don't have to but use that, that name. That, 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 I mean, uh, Maybe just if I, if, if I could, I think just to speak to that. So we tried to, to solve for this in, um, in 2014 was the last effort and we're actually working on something for January mm -hmm. where that, that was the biggest challenge. So at one level, mm -hmm. you talk about English, we did a project we called the A to Z of Kenyan mm -hmm. Twitter. And right. it was just, you know, it was just, this is a continual, you know, this is Kenya's blip in the half a billion tweets that go out every day. Right. But surely there are some nuances, some isms, some phrases, mm -hmm. catchphrases, uh, colloquialisms, like all this, this kind of lingua franca, which right. doesn't translate. Mm -hmm. uh, and so how do you just capture that, even if it's just a fraction in time and explain it? Right. So like, for instance, one of the most popular, because we, we developed a whole digital storytelling project, maybe you can link to it in the show notes. Um, like something like Zero Chills, which even African Americans mm -hmm. use, turns out it's like it ranks really well, that page, because right. people know what it is, so it's an urban dictionary, but right. people didn't know a definition and some examples. Uh -huh. um, and so even in this case, G, as voted both by actual members of KOT and selected by us, was for Grammar Nazi, mm -hmm. because they, people tend to be very pedantic about your, your, your language, your delivery, your typos, a mistake, delete that tweet, say it again right. in, a, in the right way. Mm -hmm. And so even till now, that still kind of haunts people in terms of where they scrutinize their grammar, they make sure they've not got that punctuation right. point mm -hmm. still there, right? But on Facebook and elsewhere, and this is particularly why something like Instagram is as powerful, not here, but in Tanzania, uh -huh. is the level of expressions uh, and, the, and the lengths to which somebody would take to both a, present something visually, right. they are more visual uh, culture in our estimation, uh, but ultimately with what they can do with Swahili has shown that in their market, that's the, they're doing, they've got, they're doing massively much, much more, in, even in terms of absolute right. numbers than we yeah. are. Yeah, well, we, we're running short of time, so um, I, I really need to get this in. Um, uh, on Twitter, um, uh, you've got sort of this 
it is presented almost as a democratic space, but you've got these amalgamations where one person has 200,000 followers or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, and they tend to kind of dominate conversations, you know. Um, for you, and uh, well, when you do your work and you're one of the people who's got huge uh, profiles, do you think that we are having just a small group of people sort of speaking, you know, dominating conversation, speaking, sort of punching above their weight, and, and it becomes almost as if the national conversation is, is, is reduced to what these few guys are saying. Is that your experience? Uh, uh, to some extent, that? yes. To some extent, yes. Uh, there are a few guys, there are a few guys um, who, who tend to dominate conversations. Um, the allies, the Cyprian Yakundis, mm -hmm. and whoever, and who have actually commercialized uh, their numbers, uh, they are following. Um, and, 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 and taken different political positions at different times and right. all that. Uh -huh. Defected. Uh, defected <laughs> and s switched all that. But, but I think there are others who are pretty uh, focused, who are, who are pretty, who don't, who, who, who have a mission. There are people mm. who have a mission in that space. Um, and, and if you want to, to, to know how effective those people are, the ones who are on mission, um, is the way we are talking about fake news, a uh, fake news uh, in quotes or whatever it is. But actually, this news, if you if you talk about mainstream media and fake news, but it's actually behind them there is a government, mm -hmm. right? That's what you're not saying. Uh -huh. It's uh, 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 when you talk about it, tombots, it's actually the digital right. office, digital communication office in state house that mm -hmm. is generating all this content, right? Because they can't shut down social media, so they've decided to occupy it differently. Mm -hmm and to direct conversations, right. and, uh, whether it's for political purposes, whether it's, um, I call it propaganda in PR, government yeah. by propaganda, right. capital P and R, uh, propaganda, right. uh, which is what Jubilee has been doing since 2013. Right. Um, and they become. So they were setting up all these accounts. Yeah, they set up these accounts. Hired wow. uh, people like Bogonko Bosira, who are very good at mm -hmm. fake news made before social media. Right. You uh, do gossip on the media, in the mm -hmm. uh, you know within the media circles. Right. So he's given this platform and he sets up all these. Yeah, he's actually Bogonko Bosira is not given the credit he deserves mm -hmm. because he found Itumbi. Right. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Itumbi is, is his protege and many <laughs> others, many, right. many uh, other uh, of uh, these uh, people. Uh. So. Um, the, 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 the question for me then is, um, if I can get Cyprian Nyakundi to retweet me mm -hmm. when I'm speaking something against a whole machine created by the government mm -hmm. of Kenya to push certain content, let's not call it fake news, certain perspectives within so using social media, using influencers, the influencers and bots, right. and I get uh, Alai to retweet me, or even right. I, I WhatsApp Alai and I tell uh -huh. you, you guys wanna push this out. Right. Is, is it wrong? <laughs> so that, that's what I well, but, but, but then again, the, the fact is, it's not um, uh, organic. It's not that, yeah. I mean, yeah. it, it obviously privileges some news. And um, Mark, because uh, one thing I'm asking is, is then therefore social media now getting the sort of bad habits of mainstream press? Is it, I mean, should we really draw a distinction between social media and mainstream? Or are they part of one continuum? The, the continue. I, mean, I remember we used to wait for one o'clock news or nine o'clock mm. news, mm. you know. And now you can jump on online and, and very quickly for, see. For you know, I want actually on that. Eh? Um, I, I want to talk. There's something that happened. Is it two days ago? Mm. When Ivonne Okwara, uh, the person who one of the biggest shows mm. uh, on mainstream TV mm. media, had uh, to say something around the police brutality in the university. Mm. But even the way that was disseminated, it was not so much on the platform that she uses. Mm -hmm. uh, the video was cut and put on social media. Right. It went viral. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know that's recognition that even within her space, with a national right. show, that she's not getting the kind of... Right. I think Lenus so, Kekai is another example of that. Uh, yeah. It seems like NTV has outsourced all of the responsibility to be critical of the stage to Linus Kekai's mm. Twitter feed. <laughs> because he says things on Twitter that would never yeah, ever be right. said yeah. on, on, you know, he was one of the first journalists to call 
um, this attack at the university, police brutality. Right. Maybe Samantha Pendo, he was right. one of the first journalists to actually say this is police brutality. Mm -hmm. Something that NTV, Nation, newspapers never actually Sadiq said. Sadiq Shaban of Ketin and Ketin yeah. Bureau Chief in Mombasa yeah. is doing the same also. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So is, is, is there a way that then we should distinguish or should we simply see um, uh, social media as complementary? There's, there's, there's a balance. I think, I think one thing that has to be said is I think at the end of the day with fake news as well, it's, it's, a, it's an equal opportunity game. So as much as people will be, you know, and, and some of us, and, and I, you know, maybe even some viewers, I know practitioners who try and keep like, like a swipe file, as they call it, of like, oh, it's like Jubilee um, on this side and NASA on this side and stuff. We can't really figure out in between of who's acting here. But, but basically with fake news, people are equal opportunity. So they, they will play for all sides, um, all sides are engaging in it in terms of information warfare in some capacity. And the challenge there is what I'd call uh, online media manipulation. Mm -hmm. And that can happen at several different levels. It happens at the level of I come on board and I want to bring the perception that I'm influential. So I go to a click farm in, in Myanmar, you know, like Southeast Asia, and I, and I acquire um, likes on Facebook on my page or I acquire, um, uh, you know, followers. And I start there. And then ultimately I can start to trick it to game the algorithm for trending. I can open up dozens and dozens of accounts so I can get, uh, you know, very capable college students and, they, and there are networks all organized yeah. through WhatsApp groups whose sole job is to mobilize and, and really extract resources from the public uh, relations sector in particular who have this obsession with the vanity metrics of trending, for instance. But ultimately trending has a place and has a value. We've seen that and it's articulated quite well in the dozen odd, I think like hashtags that form the basis of the, of the chapter. I think when you're talking online media manipulation, it happens at that level of the optics of these are my numbers, right? Right, uh, and then it happens at a at a deeper level in terms of I'm going to come and inject these conversations and create or, or what what they try and call uh, is um, uh, I think it's like man manipulating consensus, right? So giving this picture that well everybody but me has mm -hmm. this particular point of view. Right. So well, <laughs> I, surely it can't be that crazy because it seems like KOT, yeah, right? Talking, right? So if you game it the right way. Mm -hmm. You, we will all respectively think on our five different planes, all looking at the timeline, that KOT must be onto something here. And I respect KOT. I'm part of KOT, right? And so what you've had is these like cabals and cliques. And I've even seen people who actually, you know, it's more on the record, but who have chosen to act and make sure that it is a particular person within the, you know, like for instance, like Utumbi or the Jubilee administration who looks like the perpetrator. Right. Like th there's meta levels to this yeah. media man manipulation. The hallmark of it is when you do it so effectively that a journalist feels compelled to cover it and it runs in the mainstream media. Right. And it runs almost, and this is a real challenge in the US because with the US, people have learned, including the, the, the Russians, if you go by reports recently that if you game that top 10 trending topic list, some journalists will be compelled to report it, even though they understand fully it's fake news, mm -hmm. but because of this aspiration for partiality uh, and you know, impartiality and just being, uh, and following the public discourse, they report it and legitimize it. Right. Because ultimately, even if you look at media literacy or internet media literacy, yeah. right, in Kenya, you have this challenge where people are learning it's not as bad as the US. The US, people are learning not to trust Wikipedia, not to trust scientists, not to trust teachers or doctors. And they're being told, do your own research. And yet there are people on the other side whose sole job is to equip and enforce mm -hmm. these ideologies right. that, that make sure that they extract all the trust. Actually, uh, uh, back on that, I'll give Nanjala the last yeah, one. Sure. Because, yeah. uh, uh, but, um, if we can't trust anybody, <laughs> you know, whether it's uh, uh, Wikipedia, whether it's what our politicians say, whether it's what's in the newspaper. How can we ever hope to have a polity? How can we ever hope to have a logical, <laughs> uh, a useful discussion about policy? My big thing is always about context. I think it's, it's so easy to get caught up in this particular historical moment that we're in and to lose sight of the fact that there is actually thousands of years of human history and this is not the first time that we've been in this situation. The one thing that distinguishes different societies is critical thinking. And the big tragedy, I think, of Kenya um, is that we are not teaching our young people um, to think we haven't been for a long time mm -hmm. and societies that do not privilege critical thinking are the ones that are suffering the most of, of this fake news um, this whole this particular cultural moment you know the US 
in Kenya are very like in that way. We have just taken a machete to our education systems right. and we're telling people that if, if, if it's in the textbook, it's true. If it's on the internet, it's true. And not teaching people how to read things with a certain detached skepticism. I think the thing that saves Kenya, um, or saves is maybe a big word, the thing that keeps pulling us back from the brink is really the fact that in 1997 our economy collapsed mm -hmm. and millions of Kenyans left and went to different parts of the world and learned how to think differently and to think laterally and whatever and then they all came back. And why do I think that's important? Because we, again, building on that skepticism, that natural level of skepticism that was already in the society, you then add an element of looking at things from a certain removed distance and the, you know, being, being an outsider, being weird, being foreign, whatever, coming back to your own society and looking at it from that removed distance, you start, I, I genuinely, I, I really do strongly feel like some of the people who are having the biggest impact are the people who went and came back. Right. Um, because of that, it makes you look at your own society in a very abstract way and communicate things in a very abstract way. And I think that in this particular cultural moment, the, the way in which we can, you can't honestly contain all the information. There's always going to be misinformation. There's always going to be lies. There's always going to be manipulation. And right now, as Mark was saying, there's so much money to be made from that. What's going to save people is looking at your society from a removed perspective. You don't, it doesn't all have to be life or death all the time. And two, that critical thinking. To be able to read, uh, uh, you know, it's, you, you don't run away from the manifesto of the political party that you disagree with. Read it mm -hmm. and be able to say, well, this is untrue. This is a lie. This is a mis you know, that kind of skill, I think, is what is really needed. Otherwise, it's not the first time that human race has been right. in this situation. Mm -hmm. We just have to keep things in perspective mm -hmm. and sort of abstract and, wow. and, and objective. All right, thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, as you've seen, we've just, I think, scratched the surface uh, of this. Um, we'll be having much more uh, on, on, on the elephant um, about social media and about how the mainstream media covers the news. Um, my many thanks to Mutemi, Mark, and Angela for coming. You know, and I'm sure we'll have you on another time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we are at The Elephant Info um, uh, on Twitter. Uh, my name is Patrick Gadara, and thanks a lot for watching.